Squeeze theorem is an important law, uh, and um, we're going to use it. I can't remember. We're not going to use it a whole lot. I think we might have. Uh, we got an example here I want to look at, and then I think we might use it one more time in this class. But uh, I think if you take Calc two, you'll see it again in a different context. But uh, let's talk about what the squeeze theorem says. Sometimes it's called the sandwich theorem. If you've seen this before, it might have been called the sandwich theorem. Uh, so the idea is we've got three functions that are interacting amongst one another. And uh, the one thing that's special now is they all preserve this relationship. There's always the uh, f is on the bottom, smaller than g, g is in the middle, smaller than h, h is on top. So we've got three functions that are interacting with one another in such a way that they always beha uh, maintain this relationship. h is always on the top, g is always on the middle, f is always at the bottom. And uh, the squeeze part comes here. Um, suppose I know that there's a point where the limit of the top function and the limit of the bottom function end up being the same. So I can kind of illustrate this pretty easily. Uh, here's the point A where the top and bottom functions have a common limit value. And so I don't know, maybe this is my function F. So here's the function, sorry, this is my function H. It's on top. Uh, here's my function um, uh, f. It's on the bottom, like so. But it turns out that they both have the same limit value at this point. So the limit value here would be L. So that's the setup. F on top, H on, uh, sorry, H on top, F on bottom, and they meet up, at least limit-wise, as I'm coming in from either direction. They're both approaching the value L at A. Now, of course, uh, they don't have to be defined here, right? Uh, if I wanted to uh, make this a problem in the most general sense, um, then it's possible that this point here uh, might not actually be defined for either function. Um, but we know that doesn't matter, right? We know that for the limit to exist, it doesn't really require that the function be defined at the point. Okay, so uh, what, what's the point of all of this? Well, the point is that G must be squeezed into the same limit value, right? If this is G in between, then no matter what happens as H and F come together at the limit point, as long as G is squeezed in between them, it's being squeezed to the exact same limit value. So here's my function G of X in the middle. It is being forced to have the same limit value as F and H because they, in order to maintain that relationship. Uh, so there's a picture of the squeeze theorem and pictorially it should be pretty obvious right, how uh, the squeezing process applies to that middle function. And so, you know, here's just, a, you know, this first example. This is a direct interpretation of this result. Uh, here's the relationship that I need. P on top, Q in the middle, R on the bottom. Here's the bottom function and the top function, both being forced to the same limit value at a given point. So, based on this information, uh, what does this have to be equal to? Six, right? Same point. Q is always in the middle, so if the top and the bottom functions are being forced to the same limit value, uh, then this guy must be forced to the same limit value as well. So that's just a direct, uh, you know, all we've done is we've added a few details to that general statement. Hadn't really specified what P, Q, and R look like, but as long as they maintain this relationship, the squeeze theorem allows us to interpret the limit value of that middle function. Okay, uh, here's something a little bit more interesting. Um, here's this function. Uh, and this is the function that I know we can't actually evaluate directly because uh, we've got the, um, uh, the, the undefined quant well, yeah, undefined quantity, right? Uh, I'm taking the limit as x goes to zero, uh, but I've got this zero here in the denominator. So by direct evaluation, this is going to fail. Um, now, yeah, uh, there's a lot more to say about this limit, and if you take calculus two, you'll look at a limit like this in a lot in a in a totally different way. Uh, but for now, uh, let's let's make the following observation. Um, uh, right, the, of course, the problem is th this guy here, right? One over x can't be evaluated, so I can't do this by direct substitution. Uh, how does the squeeze theorem come into play here? Is there some way that I can bound, if, uh, and of course, if I'm trying to find the limit of a function that's unknown, what I'm really trying to do is put that guy in between two functions whose limit I do know. So the question is, is there some way that I can locate this function that's based on the cosine operator between two other functions? And of course, 
The trick is the property that the cosine operator has. Right? The cosine function itself, what does it have to be between? What's the maximum possible value of the cosine operator, no matter what its argument is? What's the ma maximum possible value of cosine? One. Right? So there's a little background from trigonometry. Hope you know that. Uh, no matter what goes inside the uh, argument, cosine itself must be less than 1. Less than or equal to. Could be equal to 1. It's got to be smaller. And what about the other end? Is cosine sandwiched in between values like we want it to be? Smallest possible value of cosine. Negative 1. So because this is the cosine operator, it would work the same for the sine function. Hope you all know, sine function has this same limitation. Uh, there, I've already got part of this squeezed in exactly the way I want it to be squeezed. Uh, the only thing left to do is account for square term. And square of x, uh, the one thing that is advantageous here, is the square of x is always a positive number. Now, if I'm multiplying by a negative number, then there's an issue here about the direction of the inequality. But x squared is always positive, especially as I approach 0. Remember, if x is approaching 0, it's never going to reach it. Like the limit assumes that we never reach the limit point. So not only is x positive, it's, I, mean, not, I mean, so x is, is positive, right? Now, of course, 0 squared is 0, but x can't be 0 in the limit form, so good. So I don't have to worry about whether the direction of the inequality is reversed. Uh, everything is set up just right. I'll multiply this entire expression by x squared. And what do I get? Well, I get exactly what I wanted. I get the cosine, the function I'm trying to measure. I've got the limit of uh, that function being squeezed between two values. The only question is, do I actually have limit values for these two ends? What is the limit as x approaches 0 for the two endpoints? So, uh, what is it? So, for the left hand endpoint, what is the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared? 0. Right? This is direct substitution. It's a polynomial function. So, this can be done by direct substitution. I plug 0 in for x, I get 0. And what about? The, the upper end. What's the limit at the upper end? Zero. Zero. Same. So there, I did it. I got this limit that I'm trying to determine, right? At first I wasn't sure. And, you know, uh, you know, without the squeeze theorem, I really don't have a whole lot that I can say about this. Uh, without the squeeze theorem, it's unclear how I would do this at all. But, uh, there. Now I've got that function whose limit I'm trying to compute. I've got it sandwiched in between two functions that it always falls between. And those two outside functions have the exact same limit value at the limit point. So what does the limit of my function have to be? Zero. So there's a method that we can use to actually compute this limit. Um, without this, uh, we don't have any other tools available to us now. Now again, in, um, let me think for a minute. Uh, no, I don't think, even in Calc 2, I don't think, yeah, that's this it. As far as the behavior of this limit form, uh, squeeze theorem is pretty much the only uh, tool that we have to actually pin down uh, what that's equal to. Now, of course, you could do this with a table, like we did today. You could put a little table of values to, and, uh, and observe the same behavior. Um, you could graph this thing. Yeah, that's going to be a tough way to do it, though. Um, but uh, as far as the exact derivation of that limit value, the squeeze theorem is our only tool. And don't forget that about the trigonometric functions. Right? That's a, that's a good clue. Uh, the trigonometric function, well, sine and cosine at least, are naturally bounded. So you can take advantage of that for the squeeze theorem because of their behaviors. Okay, good. So there's the squeeze theorem.